Have you ever decided I'm not playing this game again? Have you ever felt betrayed by the developers you believed used to make you so happy? Did Activision Blizzard, EA, or Wizards of the Coast let you down? Maybe you've been under the impression that there is a bunch of lizard people behind your favorite game. I feel that now more than ever, people love to hate gaming companies. Do you think that hatred is justified? Then maybe this video is for you. Or not. Keep watching either way. Once Sir Terry Pratchett wrote in his novel, I shall wear midnight, that evil begins when you treat people as things. I believe that's true. Once we have that concept out of the way, as I tend to do in my videos, I'm going to go through certain cases to illustrate further points later on. Let's start talking about EA. Back in the day, I'm talking about Sega Mega Drive days. EA was famous only for making good quality, but challenging games. Their cartridges used to look different to others, but they had a very loyal following, me included. Now they are renowned for microtransactions galore, buying small developers and promptly closing them down. Pay attention if you are a video game engineer and you see an EA representative walk into your boss's office. Blizzard used to be close to our hearts. The first Blizzard game I ever saw was Warcraft Orcs vs Humans, followed not long after by Diablo and Starcraft. In 2004, they gave the world the biggest MMO in the world, competing right against EverQuest 2. It used to seem to be on the side of the community for the most part, until it was acquired by Activision in 2008, along with other Vivendi properties. We had a good four-year run. Activision itself was started by four dudes who decided to break away from Atari. Most of these giants started little with good intentions. Now, let's move to Wizards of the Coast and the MTG anniversary controversy. So, I don't know what happened to Wizards of the Coast between September 2022 and March 2023, but it seemed like every executive suddenly grew a handlebar mustache and a monocle and an evil laugh, and all their actions had a fast piano dramatic tune in the background. All in black and white, with silent cinema cards that said things like, we will squish them for their money, wahahaha. So first, they start with Magic the Gathering's 30th anniversary celebration. They release some booster packs, which cost normally about four pounds, in a box of 15 boosters. The box was worth, drum roll, $1,000. What better way to celebrate with your faithful community than with a booster box that only the whales would be able to afford, and the thing was not even legal to play with. They were just an expensive souvenir. That was nothing compared with what was to come, the OGL scandal. At the peak of Dungeons & Dragons 5e, the board of directors of Wizards of the Coast decides that our game is not monetized enough. Hasbro needed money, and for the first time, they had turned to pay attention to one of the few profitable properties they still had left. Let's face it, toys don't sell as much anymore. Even toddlers have tablets nowadays. So who do they go after? Their community. See, for a long time, the community of D&D was free to create offshoot material, thanks to the OGL 1.0. Entire companies were set up to produce D20 or 5e compatible content, such as this. Adventures, alternative rules, etc. And now, in a felt soup, they cancelled their agreement and replaced it with a new OGL that charged a high percentage of commission on the sale, not the revenue, of everything sold by the community creators. And this covered everything from writers to cosplayers, dice makers, etc. They not only wanted a chunk of the money, but also to be able to use their work without even notifying the creator. Seriously, if you can go find it, it is 19 pages of evil concentrated. So unfeasibly evil that at first many people didn't even think it was real. And the only reason they retracted was that content creators like Genie D stood up and said, the executives are just looking at the repercussions of this scandal on the D&D Beyond subscriptions. Somebody informed her to do this, but we turned the tide and they yielded, but not without saying dumb death statements, just like you might think you won, but so did we. Insiders in the WOTC team heard the executives say once, the customer is an obstacle between WOTC and their wallets. Remember, these people walked back only because the initial OGL got leaked. They got caught. If they didn't, 
they would have gotten away with it. The livelihoods of tons of creators were on the line, but it also cast a light on what Watsi thinks of their users. We also know that games like Magic the Gathering are broken on purpose, and they change the tournament legal cards every few months. So the meta changes and an influx of money slides their way. Now let's talk about the opposite case, Fantasy Flight. Fantasy Flight has produced tons of board games, really good quality, although their manuals could be better written, I must say. Arkham Horror, Elder Sign, Lord of the Rings, Descent, Eldritch Horror, the Arkham Horror card game, my favorite game ever. And the few video games adaptations like Arkham Horror Mother's Embrace, they also created Call of Cthulhu, the trading card game. This was supposed to compete against Magic the Gathering at the time. It was replacing another Lovecraftian card character based game called Mythos. It failed at first, but it changed the format. It became Call of Cthulhu the living card game instead of the trading card game. The advantage of this one was that you knew what every expansion contained. There were no booster packs. The Asylum decks always contained the cards you were looking for. Even with enough copies of the base box free, you could create a bunch of decks and all of them would be viable against the most competitive ones. The result was a game that was highly loved and praised by their community, but was not bringing nearly enough money for Fantasy Flight. They pulled the plug. It was balanced. It was totally balanced. But who knows about their motivation? They also pulled the plug on Netrunner the card game. So what do I know? So now and then we get to see an influx by backlash. Wizards of the Coast screws up. We get to see an influx of users on Pathfinder and Dungeon Crawl classics. Diablo Immortal pushed users into the arms of Path of Exile. So who remains in that case and why is it worth it for a company to push their users away? The answer is whales. So is whaling good or bad? What happens when a game developer company goes whale hunting? I don't know, but I don't mind it too much. The good thing I see is that whales do belong to a type of player that lives for the flex. They generally live among multiplayer games and the flex is about their money, not their skill. Whoever tells you that they buy their gear or their levels because they don't have time to acquire it by other means is full of shit. Because a game lets you play with the gear you get. The whales just want to play with the big boys without putting the time or the effort to play with. The truth is, if that's the way they decide to have fun and the developer entertains their urges, that's fair. But that, more often than not, costs the game to everybody else. But what does someone who lives to flex do when there is no audience? What if all that was left in a game was whales? The cash influx for the game developer would be possible, but not probable, as the audience would have left and the player base would be pretty much dead. Unfortunately, there is a hierarchy of whales and investment in a game. Some people have not invested money in a game, but they have put blood, sweat and tears into it. For that mount, for that set of armor, for that mythic hammer. And no matter how surrounded by whales they found themselves, they couldn't be swayed from the game. So the problem perpetuates itself. The silver lining is that at least the whales are all kept in one place. Just don't go there if you don't like it. Let's look now at the strange case of Games Workshop or Warhammer as they have just pretty much renamed themselves online. Like Josh Strife Hayes says, almost everybody loves Games Workshop's games, but nobody likes Games Workshop. That's probably true. However, I would say two different factors make their users unhappy. The model's price hike. Not only the miniatures are super cheap to produce compared to the gross price that people have to pay for them, especially as they are allegedly produced in the UK, but even for UK standards, the price is ridiculously high. So imagine how Australians have it. They also sometimes enforce price hikes on their independent distributors for who knows what reason. Look, if you don't want anybody else to say your products, pull the cable on the distribution. That's it. Why bully everybody else? Second, there is a new edition for the rules every three years or so. It used to be a lot longer in the past. Currently, we are on the 10th edition. At the beginning of the edition, the index is released, where there are rules for every army. This time, they have released cards for every unit, and every army card pack costs around 20 pounds. Then codexes, or army books, start getting released, and new cards get released too. There is such a thing as a codex creep, 
which causes the last codex to be more powerful than the previously released to motivate people to buy the latest army. The worst part is that currently the codexes or army books come out gradually. By the time the last one comes out, a new edition gets released a couple of months after, pretty much giving you the feeling that your army, for which you paid a lot of money and just got your army book for, will be obsolete in two months. On the other hand, we have MetaWatch now in the positives, which fine tunes the win rates of every army and balances those that have a win rate that is getting a little bit out of hand. But with every patch come amendments, especially to printed material that you already own. Imagine you have to scribble that 30 pound book that you just bought, or that rule needs a post-it next to it with corrections. We can be grateful to Games Workshop for looking after the meta, but on the other hand, I still think it is far from ideal. I think if we are heading, and we should, towards an entirely digital format, that would be very much a solution. I own every Warhammer army there is, except Iron Warriors, Night Lords, World Bearers, and the Alpha Legion. So every time there is a change, it hurts. Oh, your gods, it hurts. Once Yahtzee said something about Halo 3 that stuck with me when he spoke about why he didn't understand so much of his popularity. Everything it does has been done before and better. By the way, it is also a coincidence that just a day or two ago, as of the release of this video, the whole media section of The Escapist has resigned, including Yahtzee after 16 years, as their boss, Nick Calandra, got fired because of corporate greed, not their founding second wind. Talk about backfiring for firing. Nothing super popular these days is very successful at doing anything particularly new. In the same way, Matt Mercer is not the best dungeon master because he's perfect. In these cases, it is a competition of who ticks the most boxes well, and Matt is a master ticker. Love you, dude. Hope to see you soon again. There are a ton of alternatives out there. Maybe not so polished, maybe not so popular. But this is our antidote to the lack of consideration to large game developers' companies towards their customers. I told my usual D&D group, Dungeons and Dickheads, that I wasn't gonna run any more 5e as a matter of principle, but it is not because I'm mad at Wizards of the Coast for the OGL scandal. That was just a catalyst. This is the world we live in. Like I said, in the shape things are right now, it is kind of inevitable. When I was a teenager, I wish everything I loved became more popular, so I didn't feel so much like an outcast. And I was also a metalhead, with a hint of goth, double trouble. Be careful what you wish for, they say. Popular things generate money, and this was bound to happen. Now I don't refuse to run D&D 5e because I'm resentful towards WotC. I refuse because I want to put my time and energy into promoting alternatives. And alternatives I shall give you in quick succession. To Games Workshop, we have Warlord Games. If you are interested in more obscure sci-fi and fantasy, like Slain or Judge Dread, or you are interested in historical battles. We have Mantic Games that filled the niche while everybody waited for Warhammer the Old World, their Kings of War series. Then there is Dead Zone for Skirmish and War Zone for more futuristic battles. Man, I love Skaven in space. To World of Warcraft, Elder Scrolls Online is a very good alternative with a very good community and very polished gameplay mixing action and tap targeting, just like Wildstar used to do. And all the quests are voice acted. Final Fantasy XIV, I heard is really good, never played it though. RuneScape in any format, of course. And you can always join things like Total Wow for Vanilla Plus and a good community with the developers pretty much listening to you in chat. You get hybrids and alternatives to Diablo with Path of Exile and similar games in the general like The Rising, Baldur's Gate 3 and Pillars of Eternity. To D&D, you have Pathfinder 2E, Dungeon Crawl Classics, Old School Essentials, any older edition of D&D, first edition, second edition, third edition, 3.5 edition. No, I don't have the fourth edition. Going a little bit weirder, but fun. Elric, Index Cards RPG. Merkbody, yes, that's how you pronounce it in Swedish. Pendragon, RuneQuest, Swihanda, Forbidden Lands, The One Ring. Not even fantasy now. Call of Cthulhu, Vampire the Masquerade, Cult, even though this one is not for everybody. Vicent, how not? Cyberpunk. 
Monster of the Week. There are many, many more. The only reason some board games, TTRPGs, or video games have such massive loyal fan bases, not all, is because it's what everybody else is playing. And you, as an individual, don't want to feel left out. It is a cultural issue, not a quality issue. In conclusion, don't wait for miracles. Make miracles happen yourself. And if you can't, keep an eye out for the next best thing. It sucks that a company would change your game to make it more viable for themselves. But if you look at the Call of Cthulhu card game case, sometimes that's their only choice. Other times, they're simply past the point of caring about their customers. Don't hold your breath if you see Disney movies failing for them, so they finally get the memo and change course, since thanks to cable distribution, 100 to 200 million loss means nothing to them. Look at Twitch, and don't tell me you're not aware that they have the whole might of Amazon behind them. Protesting is a natural reaction. It is good, but one needs to know when to pick a battle and when to just go home and fight another day. The only reason our protest against Wizards of the Coast worked is because the company behind them, Hasbro, had no other substantial product left to leverage. D&D was their golden goose and we held it ransom. Keep your old games. I still play Golden Axe. You run the 5th edition D&D in whatever way you want. It's your book. They can't take it away from you. Hell, you only need dice and pen and paper to make your own game. The rules are there to make things fair among the players, and as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter what you come up with. All that really matters is the story and the characters. That's the mistake the executives of Wizards of the Coast was. You can't monetize sitting with your friends to tell stories. You don't need a subscription to D&D Beyond. If your favorite game ticks a lot of boxes, maybe one that ticks less is the alternative you need. When the difference is getting so expensive, it's not worth it anymore. Don't wait for companies to suddenly grow a heart. You and your mates may quit a game for a couple of months as a sign of protest, and the money you don't give the developers, they will make up with whale hunting. Also, you may not realize it, but you have changed too. You're likely not in the same position in your life that you were in when you could rate for eight hours straight. They certainly have changed. And even though I could potentially rate for a whole day, my priorities have changed too. And don't wait for whales to go away. There are people with thousands of pounds to spend on games and they are profitable for game developers. Good for them if they can spend the money. Just avoid them if they manage to unbalance the game or change games altogether. Just keep playing, investigate, and when you find something you love, cherish the memories you make there and then. Keep them close to your heart. You might lose the friends you made along the way, or the community. Stormwind and Orgrimmar might get emptier and lonelier, but your memories will last forever. Thank you for watching. Oh, and subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs>